Chapter Eight of Different Girls. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kate Fallis. Different Girls Harper's Novelettes. The Stout Miss Hopkins Bicycle by Octave Tanet there was a skeleton in mrs margaret ellis's closet the same skeleton abode also in the closet of miss lorania hopkins the skeleton which really does not seem a proper word was the dread of growing stout they were more afraid of flesh than of sin yet they were both good women mrs ellis regularly attended church and could always be depended on to show hospitality to convention delegates whether clerical or lay she was a liberal subscriber to every good work she was almost the only woman in the church aid society that never lost her temper at the sole vexing time of the church fair and she had a larger clientele of regular pensioners than any one in town unless it were her friend miss hopkins who was so good to the poor that never a tramp slighted her kitchen miss hopkins was as amiable as mrs ellis and always put her name under that of mrs ellis with exactly the same amount on the subscription papers she could have given more for she had the larger income but she had no desire to outshine her friend whom she admired as the most charming of women mrs ellis indeed was agreeable as well as good and a pretty woman to the bargain if she did not choose to be weighed before people miss hopkins often told her that she was not really stout she merely had a plump trig little figure miss hopkins alas was really stout the two waged a warfare against the flesh equal to the apostles in vigour although so much less deserving of praise mrs ellis drove her cook to distraction with diverse dieting systems from bentings and dr salisbury's to the latest exhortations of some unknown newspaper prophet she bought elaborate gymnastic appliances and swung dumbbells and rode imaginary horses and propelled imaginary boats she ran races with a professional trainer and she studied the principles of delsart and solemnly whirled on one foot and swayed her body and rolled her head and hopped and kicked and genuflected in company with eleven other stout and earnest matrons and one slim and giggling girl who almost choked at every lesson in all these exercises miss hopkins faithfully kept her company which was the easier as miss hopkins lived in the next house a conscientious colonial mansion with all the modern conveniences hidden beneath the old-fashioned pomp and yet despite these struggles and self-denials it must be told that margaret ellis and lorania hopkins were little thinner for their warfare still as shuey cardigan the trainer told mrs ellis there was no knowing what they might have weighed had they not struggled it ain't only the fat that's on ye moin ye says shuey with a confidential sympathy of mien it's what ye'd naturally be getting in addition and first ye've got to peel off that and then ye come down to the other shuey was so much the most successful of mrs ellis's reducers that his words were weighty and when at last shuey said i got what you need mrs ellis listened you need a bike no less says shuey but i could never ride one said margaret opening her pretty brown eyes and wrinkling her grecian forehead 
you'd ride in six lessons but how would i look cardigan you look noble ma'am what do you consider the best wheel cardigan the advertising rules of magazines prevent my giving cardigan's answer it is enough that the wheel glittered at mrs ellis's door the very next day and that a large pasteboard box was delivered by the expressman the very next week he went on to miss hopkins and delivered the twin of the box with a similar yellow printed card bearing the impress of the same great firm on the inside of the box cover for margaret had hired her to lorania hopkins the instant shuey was gone she presented herself breathless a little to the embarrassment of lorania who was sitting with her niece before a large box of crackerjack it's a new kind of candy i was just tasting it maggie faltered she while the niece a girl of nineteen with the inhuman spirits of her age laughed aloud you needn't mind me said mrs ellis cheerfully i'm eating potatoes now oh maggie miss hopkins breathed the words between envy and disapproval mrs ellis tossed her brown head airily not a whit abashed and i had beer for luncheon and am going to have champagne for dinner maggie how do you dare did they did they taste good they tasted heavenly lorania pass me the candy i am going to try something new the thinningest thing there is i read in the paper of one woman who lost forty pounds in three months and is losing still if it is obesity pills i it isn't it's a bicycle lorania you and i must ride sybil hopkins you heartless child what are you laughing at lorania rose in the glass over the mantel her figure returned her gaze there was no mistake except that as is often the case with stout people that glass always increased her size she was a stout lady she was taller than the average of women and well proportioned and still light on her feet but she could not blink away the records she was heavy on the scales did she stand looking at herself squarely her form was shapely enough although larger than she could wish but the full force of the revelation fell when she allowed herself a profile view she having what is called a round waist and being almost as large one way as another yet lorania was only thirty-three years old and was of no mind to retire from society and have a special phaeton built for her use and hear from her mother's friends how much her mother weighed before her death how should i look on a wheel she asked even as mrs ellis had asked before and mrs ellis stoutly answered you'd look noble shuey will teach us she went on and we can have a track made in your pasture where nobody can see us learning lorania there's nothing like it let me bring you the bicycle edition of harper's bazaar miss hopkins capitulated at once and sat down to order her costume while sibyl the niece revelled silently in visions of a new bicycle which should presently revert to her for it's ridiculous auntie's thinking of riding miss sibyl considered she would be a figure of fun on a wheel besides she can never learn in this world yet sibyl was attached to her aunt and enjoyed visiting hopkins manor as lorania had named her new house into which she moved on the same day that she joined the colonial dames by right of her ancestor the great and good divine commemorated by mrs stowe lorania's friends were all fond of her she was so good-natured and tolerant with a touch of dry humour in her vision of things and not the least puritan in her frank enjoyment of ease and luxury nevertheless lorania had a good 
able-bodied new england conscience capable of staying awake nights without flinching and perhaps from her stanch old puritan forefathers she inherited her simple integrity so that she never lied nor cheated even in the small whitewashed manner of her sex and valued loyalty above most of the virtues she had an innocent pride in her godly and martial ancestry which was quite on the surface and led people who did not know her to consider her haughty for fifteen years she had been an orphan the mistress of a very large estate no doubt she had been sought often in marriage but never until lately had lorania seriously thought of marrying sibyl said that she was too unsentimental to marry really she was too romantic she had a longing to be loved not in the quiet matter-of-fact manner of her suitors but with the passion of the poets therefore the presence of another skeleton in mrs ellis's closet because she knew about a certain handsome italian marquis who at this period was conducting an impassioned wooing by mail margaret did not fancy the marquis he was not an american he would take lorania away she thought this very virtue floored and suspected that he had learned his love-making in a bad school she dropped dark hints that frightened lorania who would sometimes piteously demand don't you think he could care for me for for myself margaret knew that she had an overweening distrust of her own appearance how many tears she had shed first and last over her unhappy plumpness it would be hard to reckon she made no account of her satin skin or her glossy black hair or her lustrous violet eyes with their long black lashes or her flashing white teeth she glanced dismally at her shape and scornfully at her features good honest irregular american features that might not satisfy a greek critic but suited each other and pleased her countrymen and then she would sigh heavily over her figure her friend had not the heart to impute the marquis's beautiful artless compliments to mercenary motives after all the italian was a good fellow according to the point of view of his own race if he did intend to live on his wife's money and had a very varied assortment of memories of women but margaret dreaded and disliked him all the more for his good qualities to-day this secret apprehension flung a cloud over the bicycle enthusiasm she could not help wondering whether at this moment lorania was not thinking of the marquis who rode a wheel and a horse admirably aunt lorania said sibyl there comes mr winslow shall i run out and ask him about those cloth of gold roses the aphids are eating them all up yes to be sure dear but don't let ferguson suspect what you are talking of he might feel hurt ferguson was the gardener miss hopkins left her note to go to the window below she saw a mettled horse with tossing head and silken skin restlessly fretting on his bit and pawing the dust in front of the fence while his rider hat in hand talked with the young girl he was a little man a very little man in a grey business suit of the best cut and material an air of careful and dainty neatness was diffused about both horse and rider he bent towards miss sibyl's charming person a thin alert fair face his head was finely shaped the brown hair worn away a little on the temples he smiled gravely at intervals the smile told that he had a dimple in his cheek i wonder said mrs ellis whether mr winslow can have a penchant for sibyl lorania opened her eyes at this moment mr winslow had caught sight of her at the window and he bowed almost to his saddle-bow 
sybil was saying something at which she laughed and he visibly reddened it was a peculiarity of his that his colour turned easily in a second his hat was on his head and his horse bounded half across the road hardly i think said lorania how well he rides i never knew any one ride better in this country i suppose sybil would ridicule such a thing said mrs ellis continuing her own train of thought and yet vaguely disturbed by the last sentence why should she well he is so little for one thing and she is so tall and then sybil thinks a great deal of social position he is a winslow said lorania arching her neck unconsciously a lineal descendant from kenelm winslow who came over in the may but his mother i don't know anything about his mother before she came here oh of course i know the gossip that she was a niece of the overseer at a village poorhouse and that her husband quarrelled with all his family and married her in the poorhouse and i know that when he died here she would not take a cent from the winslows nor let them have the boy she is the meekest-looking little woman but she must have an iron streak in her somewhere for she was left without enough money to pay the funeral expenses and she educated the boy and accumulated money enough to pay for this place they have she used to run a laundry and made money but when cyril got a place in the bank she sold out the laundry and went into chickens and vegetables she told somebody that it wasn't so profitable as the laundry but it was more genteel and cyril being now in a position of trust at the bank she must consider him cyril swept out the bank people laughed about it but do you know i rather liked mrs winslow for it she isn't in the least an assertive woman how long have we been up here maggie isn't it four years and they have been our next-door neighbours and she has never been inside the house nor he either for that matter except once when it took fire you know and he came in with that funny little chemical engine tucked under his arm and took off his hat in the same prim polite way that he takes it off when he talks to sybil and said if you'll excuse me offering advice miss hopkins it is not necessary to move anything it mars furniture very much to move it out of fire i think if you will allow me i can extinguish this and he did too didn't he as neatly and as coolly as if it were only adding up a column of figures and offered me the engine as a souvenir lorania you never told me that it seemed like making fun of him when he had been so kind i declined as civilly as i could i hope i didn't hurt his feelings i meant to pay a visit to his mother and ask them to dinner but you know i went to england that week and somehow when i came back it was difficult it seems a little odd we never have seen more of the winslows but i fancy they don't want either to intrude or to be intruded on but he is certainly very obliging about the garden think of all the slips and flowers he has given us and the advice all passed over the fence it is funny our neighbourly good offices which we render at arm's length how long have you known him oh a long time he is cashier of my bank you know first he was teller then assistant cashier and now for five years he has been cashier the president wants to resign and let him be president but he hardly has enough stock for that but oliver says oliver was miss hopkins's brother that there isn't a shrewder or straighter banker in the state oliver knows him he says he is a sandy little fellow well he is assented mrs ellis it isn't many cashiers would let robbers stab them and shoot them and leave them for dead rather than give up the combination of the safe he wouldn't take a cent for it either and he saved ever so many thousand dollars yes he is brave i went to the same school with him once and saw him fight a big boy twice his size such a nasty boy who called me fatty and made a kissing noise with his lips just to scare me and poor little cyril winslow got awfully beaten and when i saw him on the ground with his nose bleeding and that big brute pounding him i ran to the water bucket and poured the whole bucket on that big bullying boy and stopped the fight 
just as the teacher got on the scene i cried over little sarah winslow he was crying himself i ain't crying because he hurt me he sobbed i'm crying because i'm so mad i didn't lick him i wonder if he remembers that episode perhaps said mrs ellis maggie what makes you think he is falling in love with sybil mrs ellis laughed i dare say he isn't in love with sybil said she i think the main reason was his always riding by here instead of taking the shorter route down the other street does he always ride by here i hadn't noticed always said mrs ellis i have noticed i am sorry for him said lorania musingly i think sybil is very much taken with that young captain carr at the arsenal young girls always affect the army he is a nice fellow but i don't think he is the man winslow is now maggie advise me about the suit i don't want to look like the escaped fat lady of a museum lorania thought no more of sybil's love affairs if she thought of the winslows it was to wish that mrs winslow would sell or rent her pasture which in addition to her own and mrs ellis's pastures thrown into one would make such a delightful bicycle track the winslow house was very different from the two villas that were the pride of fairport a little story and a half cottage peeped out on the road behind the tall maples that were planted when winslow was a boy but there was a wonderful green velvet lawn and the tulips and sweet peas and pansies that blazed softly nearer the house were as beautiful as those over which miss lorania's gardener toiled and worried mrs winslow was a little woman who showed the fierce struggle of her early life only in the deeper lines between her delicate eyebrows and the expression of melancholy patience in her brown eyes she always wore a widow's cap and a black gown in the mornings she donned a blue figured apron of stout and serviceable stuff in the afternoon an apron of that sheer white lawn used by bishops and smart young waitresses of an afternoon in warm weather she was accustomed to sit on the eastern piazza next to the hopkins place and rock as she sewed she was thus sitting and sewing when she beheld an extraordinary procession cross the hopkins lawn first marched the tall trainer shuey cardigan who worked by day in the lossing furniture factory and gave bicycle lessons at the armory evenings he was clad in a white sweater and buff leggings and was wheeling a lady's bicycle behind him walked miss hopkins in a grey suit the skirt of which only came to her ankles she was always so dignified in her toilets land sakes gasped mrs winslow if she ain't going to ride a bike well what next what really happened next was the sneaking for no other word does justice to the cautious and circuitous movements of her of mrs winslow to the stable which had one window facing the hopkins pasture no cows were grazing in the pasture all around the grassy plateau twinkled a broad brownish-yellow track at one side of this track a bench had been placed and a table pleasing to the eye with jugs and glasses mrs ellis in a suit of the same undignified brevity and ease as miss hopkins sat on the bench supporting her own wheel shuey cardigan was drawn up to his full six feet of strength and one arm in the air was explaining the theory of the balance of power it was an uncanny moment to lorania she eyed the glistening restless thing that slipped beneath her hand and her fingers trembled if she could have fled in secret she would but since flight was not possible she assumed a firm expression mrs ellis wore a smile of studied and sickly cheerfulness don't you think it very high said lorania 
i can never get up on it it will be by the block at first said shuey in the soothing tones of a jockey to a nervous horse it's easy by the block and i'll be steadying it of course don't they have any larger saddles it is a very small saddle they're all of a size it wouldn't look sporty larger it would look like a special make yous wouldn't want a special make lorania thought that she would be thankful for a special make but she suppressed the unsportsmanlike thought the pedals are very small too cardigan are you sure they can hold me they would hold two of ye miss hopkins now sit aisy and graceful as you would on your chair at home hold the shoulders back and toe in a bit on the pedals ye won't be skinning your ankles so much then and hold your foot up ready to get the other pedal hold light on the steering bar push off hard now will you hold me i'm going oh it's like riding an earthquake here shuey made a run letting the wheel have its own wild way to reach the balance keep the front wheel under you he cried cheerfully never mind where you go keep a pedaling whatever you do keep a pedaling but i haven't got but one pedal gasped the rider ye lost it no i never had but one oh don't let me fall oh ye lost it in the beginning now then i'll hold it steady and you get both feet right here we go swaying frightfully from side to side and wrenched from capsizing the wheel by the full exercise of shuey's great muscles miss hopkins reeled over the track at short intervals she lost her pedals and her feet for some strange reason instead of seeking the lost simply curled up as if afraid of being hit she gripped the steering handles with an iron grasp and her turns were such as an engine makes nevertheless shuey got her up the track for some hundred feet and then by a herculean sweep turned her round and rolled her back to the block it was at this painful moment when her whole being was concentrated on the effort to keep from toppling against shuey and even more to keep from toppling away from him that lorania's strained gaze suddenly fell on the frightened and sympathetic face of mrs winslow the good woman saw no fun in the spectacle but rather an awful risk to life and limb their eyes met not a change passed over miss hopkins features but she looked up as soon as she was safe on the ground and smiled in a moment before mrs winslow could decide whether to run or to stand her ground she saw the cyclist approaching on foot won't you come in and sit down she said smiling we are trying our new wheels and because she did not know how to refuse mrs winslow suffered herself to be handed over the fence she sat on the bench beside miss hopkins in the prim attitude which had pertained to gentility in her youth her hands loosely clasping each other her feet crossed at the ankles it's an awful sight ain't it she breathed those little shiny things i don't see how you ever get on them i don't get on them said miss hopkins the only way i shall ever learn to start off is to start without the pedals does your son ride mrs winslow no ma'am said mrs winslow but he knows how when he was a boy nothing would do but he must have a bicycle one of those things most as big as a mill wheel and if you fell off you broke yourself somewhere sure i always expected he'd be brought home in pieces so i don't think he'd have any manner of difficulty why look at your friend she's most riding alone she could always do everything better than i cried lorania with ungrudging admiration see how she jumps off now i can't jump off any more than i can jump on it seems so ridiculous to be told to press hard on the pedal on the side where you want to jump and swing your further leg over first and cut a kind of a figure eight with your legs and turn your wheel the way you don't want to go all at once well i'm trying to think of all those directions i always fall off 
i got that wheel only yesterday and fell before i even got away from the block one of my arms looks like a persian ribbon mrs winslow cried out in unfeigned sympathy she wished miss hopkins would use her liniment that she used for cyril when he was hurt by the burglars at the bank he was bruised terrible that must have been an awful time to you said lorania looking with more interest than she had ever felt on the meek little woman and she noticed the tremble in the decorously clasped hands yes ma'am was all she said i've often looked over at you on the piazza and thought how cosy you looked mr winslow always seems to be at home evenings yes ma'am we sit a great deal on the piazza cyril's a good boy he wa'n't nine when his father died and he's been like a man helping me there never was a boy had such willing little feet and he'd set right there on the steps and pat my slipper and say what he'd get me when he got to earn money and he's got me every last thing foolish and all that he said there's that black satin gown a sin and a shame for a plain body like me but he would get it cyril's got a beautiful disposition too just like his pa's and he's a handy man about the house and prompt at his meals i wonder sometimes if cyril was to get married if his wife would mind his running over now and then and setting with me a while she was speaking more rapidly and her eyes strayed wistfully over to the hopkins piazza where sibyl was sitting with the young soldier lorania looked at her pityingly why surely said she mothers have kinder selfish feelings said mrs winslow moistening her lips and drawing a quick breath still watching the girl on the piazza it's so sweet and peaceful for them they forget their sons may want something more but it's kinder hard giving all your little comforts up at once when you've had em right with you so long and could cook just what he liked and go right into his room nights if he coughed it's all right all right but it's kinder hard and beautiful young ladies that have had everything all their lives might might not understand that a homespun old mother isn't wanting to force herself on them at all when they have company and they have no call to fear it there was no doubt however obscure the word seemed that mrs winslow had a clear purpose in her mind nor that she was tremendously in earnest little blotches of red dabbled her cheeks her breath came more quickly and she swallowed between her words lorania could see the quiver in the muscles of her throat she clasped her hands tight lest they should shake he's in love with sibyl thought lorania the poor woman she felt sorry for her and she spoke gently and reassuringly no girl with a good heart can help feeling tenderly towards her husband's mother mrs winslow nodded you're real comforting said she she was silent a moment and then said in a different tone you ain't got a large enough track wouldn't you like to have our pasture too lorania expressed her gratitude and invited the winslows to see the practice my niece will come out to-morrow she said graciously yes she's a real fine appearing young lady said mrs winslow both the cyclists exulted neither of them however was prepared to behold the track made and the fence down the very next morning when they came out about ten o'clock to the west side of miss hopkins boundaries as sure as you live maggie exclaimed lorania eagerly he's got it all done now that is something like a lover i only hope his heart won't be bruised as black and blue as i am with the wheel shuey says the only harm your falls do you is to take away your confidence said mrs ellis he wouldn't say so if he could see my knees retorted miss hopkins mrs ellis it will be observed sheared away from the love affairs of mr cyril winslow she had not yet made up her mind and mrs ellis who had been married did not jump at conclusions regarding the heart of man so rapidly as her spinster friend she preferred to talk of the bicycle 
nor did miss hopkins refuse the subject to her at this moment the most important object on the globe was the shining machine which she would allow no hand but hers to oil and dust both mrs ellis and she were simply prostrated as to their mental powers by this new sport they could not think nor talk nor read of anything but the wheel this is a peculiarity of the bicyclist no other sport appears to make such havoc with the mind one can learn to swim without describing his sensations to every casual acquaintance or hunting up the natatorial columns in the newspapers one may enjoy riding a horse and yet go about his ordinary business with an equal mind one learns to play golf and still remains a peaceful citizen who can discuss politics with interest but the cyclist man or woman is soaked in every pore with the delight and the perils of wheeling he talks of it as he thinks of it incessantly for this fatuous passion there is one excuse other sports have the fearful delight of danger and the pleasure of the consciousness of dexterity and the dogged anglo-saxon joy of combat and victory but no other sport restores to middle age the pure exultant muscular intoxication of childhood only on the wheel can an elderly woman feel as she felt when she ran and leaped and frolicked amid the flowers as a child the rainia of course no longer jumped or ran she kicked in the delsart exercises but it was a measured calculated one may say cold-blooded kick which limbered her muscles but did not restore her youthful glow of soul her legs and not her spirits pranced the same thing may be said for margaret ellis now between their accidents they obtained glimpses of an exquisite exhilaration and there was also to be counted the approval of their consciences for they felt that no turkish bath could wring out moisture from their systems like half an hour's pumping at the bicycle treadles lorania during the month had ridden through one bottle of liniment and two of witch hazel and by the end of the second bottle could ride a short distance alone but lorania could not yet dismount unassisted and several times she had felled poor winslow to the earth when he rashly adventured to stop her captain carr had a peculiar graceful fling of the arm catching the saddle-bar with one hand while he steadied the handles with the other he did not hesitate in the least to grab lorania's belt if necessary but poor modest winslow who fell upon the wheel and dared not touch the hem of a lady's bicycle skirt was as one in the path of a cyclone and appeared daily in a fresh pair of white trousers yous have now shuey remarked impressively one day you have now arrived at the most difficult and dangerous period in learning the wheel it's similar to a baby when it's first learned to walk but ain't yet got sense in walking when it was little it would stay put wherever you put it and it didn't know enough to go by itself which is similar to you when i was holding ye you couldn't fall but now you're off alone depending on yourself objects struck by every tree taking most of the pasture to turn in and not able to get off save by falling oh couldn't you go with her somehow exclaimed mrs winslow appalled at the picture wouldn't a rope round her be of some help i used to put it round cyril when he was learning to walk well no ma'am said shuey patiently don't you be scared the riding will come she's getting on grandly and ye should see mr winslow tis a pleasure to teach him he rode in one lesson i ain't learning him nothing but tricks now but mr winslow why don't you ride here with us said sibyl with her coquettish and flattering smile we're always hearing of your beautiful riding are we never to see it i think mr winslow is waiting for that swell english cycle suit that i hear about said the captain grinning and winslow grew red to his eyelids lorania gave an indignant side glance at sibyl why need the girl make game of an honest man who loved her 
sybil was biting her lips and darting side glances at the captain she called the pasture practice slow but she seemed nevertheless to enjoy herself sitting on the bench the captain on one side and winslow on the other rattling off her girlish jokes while her aunt and mrs ellis with the anxious set faces of the beginner were peddling frantically after cardigan lorania began to pity winslow for it was growing plain to her that sybil and the captain understood each other she thought that even if sybil did care for the soldier she need not be so careless of winslow's feelings she talked with the cashier herself trying to make amends for sybil's absorption in the other man and she admired the fortitude that concealed the pain that he must feel it became quite the expected thing for the winslows to be present at the practice but winslow had not yet appeared on his wheel he used to bring a box of candy with him or rather three boxes one for each lady he said and a box of peppermints for his mother he was always very attentive to his mother and fancy aunt margaret laughed sybil he has asked both auntie and me to the theatre he is not going to compromise himself by singling one of us out he is a careful soul by the way aunt margaret mrs winslow was telling me yesterday that i am the image of auntie at my age am i do i look like her was she as slender as i almost said mrs ellis who was not so inflexibly truthful as her friend no sybil said lorania with a deep deep sigh i was always plump i was a chubby child and oh what do you think i heard in the crowd at manley's once one woman said to another miss hopkins has got a wheel miss sybil said the other no the stout miss hopkins said the first creature and the second lorania groaned what did she say to make you feel that way she said she said oh my answered lorania with a dying look well she was horrid said mrs ellis but you know you have grown thin come on let's ride i never shall be able to ride said lorania gloomily i can get on but i can't get off and they've taken off the brake so i can't stop and i'm object struck by everything i look at some day i shall look downhill well my will's in the lower drawer of the mahogany desk perhaps the rainia had an occult inkling of the future for this is what happened that evening winslow rode on to the track in his new english bicycle suit which had just come he hoped that he didn't look like a fool in those queer clothes but the instant he entered the pasture he saw something that drove everything else out of his head and made him bend over the steering bar and race madly across the green miss hopkins bicycle was running away downhill cardigan on foot was pelting obliquely in the hopeless thought to intercept her while mrs ellis who was reeling over the ground with her own bicycle wheeled as rapidly as she could to the brow of the hill where she tumbled off and abandoning the wheel rushed on foot to her friend's rescue she was only in time to see a flash of silver and ebony and a streak of brown dart before her vision and swim down the hill like a bird lorania was still in the saddle pedalling from sheer force of habit and clinging to the handlebars below the hill was a stone wall and farther was a creek there was a narrow opening in the wall where the cattle went down to drink if she could steer through that she would have nothing worse than soft water and mud but there was not one chance in a thousand that she could pass that narrow space mrs winslow horror-stricken watched the rescuer who evidently was cutting across to catch the bicycle he's riding out of sight thought shuey in the rear he himself did not slacken his speed although he could not be in time for the catastrophe suddenly he stiffened winslow was close to the runaway wheel grab her 
yelled shuey grab her by the belt oh lord the exclamation exploded like the groan of a shell for while winslow's bicycling was all that could be wished and he flung himself in the path of the oncoming wheel with marvellous celerity and precision he had not the power to withstand the never yet revealed number of pounds carried by miss lorania impelled by the rapid descent and gathering momentum at every whirl they met he caught her but instantly he was rolling down the steep incline and she was doubled up on the grass he crashed sickeningly against the stone wall she lay stunned and still on the sod and their friends with beating hearts slid down to them mrs winslow was on the brow of the hill she blesses shuey to this day for the shout he sent up nobody killed and i guess no bones broken when margaret went home that evening having seen her friend safely in bed not much the worse for her fall she was told that cardigan wished to see her shuey produced something from his pocket saying i picked this up on the hill ma'am after the accident it maybe belongs to him or it maybe belongs to her i'm thinking the safest way is to just give it to you he handed mrs ellis a tiny gold-framed miniature of lorania in a red leather case the morning was a sparkling june morning dewy and fragrant and the sunlight burnished handle and pedal of the friends bicycles standing on the piazza unheeded it was the hour for morning practice but miss hopkins slept in her chamber and mrs ellis sat in the little parlour adjoining and thought she did not look surprised at the maid's announcement that mrs winslow begged to see her for a few moments mrs winslow was pale she was a good sketch of discomfort on the very edge of her chair clad in the black silk which she wore sundays her head crowned with her bonnet of state and her hands stiff in a pair of new gloves i hope you'll excuse me not sending up a card she began cyril got me some going on a year ago and i thought i could lay my hand right on em but i'm so nervous this morning i hunted all over and they wasn't anywhere i won't keep you i just wanted to ask if you picked up anything a, a little red russia leather case was it a miniature a miniature of my friend miss hopkins i thought it all over and i came to explain you no doubt think it strange and i can assure you that my son never let any human being look at that picture i never knew about it myself till it was lost and he got out of his bed he ain't hardly able to walk and staggered over here to look for it and i followed him and so he had to tell me he had it painted from a picture that came out in the papers he felt it was an awful liberty but you don't know how my boy feels mrs ellis he has worshipped that woman for years he ain't never had a thought of anybody but her since they was children in school and yet he's been so modest and so shy of pushing himself forward that he didn't do a thing until i put him on to help you with this bicycle margaret ellis did not know what to say she thought of the marquis and mrs winslow poured out her story he ain't never said a word to me till this morning but don't i know don't i know who looked out so careful for her investments don't i know who was always looking out for her interest silent and always keeping himself in the background why she couldn't even buy a cow that he won't looking round to see she got a good one twas him saw the gardener and kept him from buying that cow with tuberculosis cause he knew about the herd he knew by finding out he worshipped the very cow she owned you may say and i've seen him patting and feeding up her dogs it's to our house that big mastiff always goes every night mrs ellis it ain't often that a woman gets love such as my son is offering only a dozen offer it and it ain't often a woman is loved by such a good man as my son he ain't got any bad habits he'll die before he wrongs anybody and he has got the sweetest temper you ever see and he's the tidiest man about the house you could ask and the promptest about meals mrs ellis looked at her flushed face and sent another flood of colour into it for she said 
mrs winslow i don't know how much good i may be able to do but i am on your side her eyes followed the little black figure when it crossed the lawn she wondered whether her advice was good for she had counselled that winslow come over in the evening maggie said a voice lorania was in the doorway maggie she said i ought to tell you that i heard every word then i can tell you cried mrs ellis that he is fifty times more of a man than the marquis and loves you fifty thousand times better lorania made no answer not even by a look what she felt mrs ellis could not guess nor was she any wiser when winslow appeared at her gate just as the sun was setting i didn't think i would better intrude on miss hopkins said he but perhaps you could tell me how she is this evening my mother told me how kind you were and perhaps you you would advise if i might venture to send miss hopkins some flowers out of the kindness of her heart mrs ellis averted her eyes from his face thus she was able to perceive lorania saunter out of the hopkins gate so changed was she by the bicycle practice that wrapped in her niece's shawl she made margaret think of the girl an inspiration flashed to her she knew the cashier's dependence on his eyeglasses and he was not wearing them if you want to know how miss hopkins is why not speak to her niece now said she he started he saw miss sibyl as he supposed and he went swiftly down the street miss sibyl he began may i ask how is your aunt and then she turned she blushed then she laughed aloud has the bicycle done so much for me said she the bicycle didn't need to do anything for you he cried warmly mrs ellis a little distance in the rear heard turned and walked thoughtfully away they're off said she she had acquired a sporting tinge of thought from shuey cardigan if with that start he can't make the running it's a wonder i have invited mr winslow and his mother to dinner said miss hopkins in the morning will you come too maggie i'll back him against the marquis thought margaret gleefully a week later lorania said i really think i must be getting thinner fancy mr winslow who was so clear-sighted mistaking me for sibyl he says i told him how i had suffered from my figure he says it can't be what he has suffered from his do you think him so very short maggie of course he isn't tall but he has an elegant figure i think and i never saw anywhere such a rider mrs ellis answered heartily he isn't very small and he is a beautiful figure on the wheel and added to herself i know what was in that letter she sent yesterday to the marquis but to think it's all being due to the bicycle end of chapter eight chapter nine of different girls this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org different girls harper's novelettes the marrying of esther by mary m mears set there and cry it's so sensible and i ain't said that a june weddin wouldn't be a little nicer but what you goin to live on joe can't get his money that soon he said he thought he could manage but i won't be married at all if i can't have it right well you can have it right all is there are some folks in this town that if they don't calculate doing real well by you i don't feel called upon to invite i, I don't know what you mean sobbed the girl she sat by the kitchen table her face hidden in her arms her mother stood looking at her tenderly and yet with a certain anger i mean about the presents you've worked in the church you've sung in the choir for years and now it's a chance for folks to show that they appreciate it and without their going to boxes of cake would be plenty if they weren't going to serve you any better than they did ella plummet esther robinson lifted her head she was quite large in a soft young way 
and her skin was as pure as a baby's. But you can't know beforehand how they're going to treat me. Yes, I can know beforehand, too, and if you're set on next month it's none too soon to be seen about it. I've a good mind to step over to Miss Lawrence's and Miss Stetson's this afternoon. Mother, you wouldn't ask em anything. Mrs. Robinson hung away her dish-towel, then she faced Esther. Of course I wouldn't ask em. There's other ways of finding out besides askin'. I'd bring the subject round by saying I hoped there wouldn't be many duplicates, and I'd get out of em what they intended giving without seeming to. Esther looked at her mother with a sort of fascination. Then we could give some idea about the refreshments, for I ain't a going to have no elaborate layout without I do know, and it ain't because I grudge the money either, she added, in swift self-defense. Mrs. Robinson was a good manager of the moderate means her husband had left her, but she was not parsimonious or inhospitable. Now she was actuated by a fierce maternal jealousy. Esther, despite her pleasant ways and her helpfulness, was often overlooked in a social way. This was due to her mother. The more pretentious laughed about Mrs. Robinson, and though the thrifty, contented housewife never missed the amenities which might have been extended to her, she was keenly alive to any slights put upon her daughter. And so it was now. Mrs. Lawrence, a rich, childless old lady, lived next door, and about four o'clock she went over there. The girl watched her departure doubtfully, but the possibility of not having a large wedding kept her from giving a full expression to her feelings. Esther had always dreamed of her wedding. She had looked forward to it just as definitely, before she met Joe Ellsworth, as after her engagement to him. There would be flowers and guests and feasting, and she would be the centre of it all, in a white dress and veil. She had never thought about there being any presents. Now, for the first time, she thought of them as an added glory— but her imagination did not extend to the separate articles or to their givers. Esther never pictured her Uncle Jonas at the wedding, yet he would surely be in attendance in his rough farmer clothes, his grizzled, keen old face towering above the other guests. She did not picture her friends as she really knew them. The young men would be fine gentlemen, and the girls ladies in wonderful toilets. As for herself and Joe, Hidden away in a bureau drawer, Esther had a poster of one of Froman's plays. It represented a bride and groom standing together in a drift of orange blossoms. Mrs. Robinson did not return at supper-time, and Esther ate alone. At eight o'clock, Joe Ellsworth came. She met him at the door, and they kissed in the entry. Then Joe preceded her in, and hung up his cap on a projecting knob of the what-not. That was where he always put it. He glanced into the dining-room and took in the waiting-table. "'Haven't you had supper yet?' "'Mother isn't home.' He came towards her swiftly. His eyes shone with a sudden elated tenderness. She raised her arm and turned away her face, but he swept aside the ineffectual barrier. When he let her go, she seated herself on the farther side of the room. Her glance was full of a soft rebuke. He met it, then looked down smilingly and awkwardly at his shoes. "'Where did you say your ma's gone?' She's gone to Miss Lawrence's, and a few other places. Oh, calling. Old Miss Norton goes about twice a year, and I ask her what it amounts to. I guess he'll find Ma's calls will unmount to something. How's that? he demanded. She's going to try and find out what they intend giving. What they intend giving? Yes, and without they intend giving something worth while, she says she won't invite em. And maybe we won't have a big wedding at all, she finished pathetically. Joe did not answer. Esther stole an appealing glance at him. "'Does it seem a queer thing to do?' "'Well, yes, rather.' Her face quivered. She said, "'I'd done so much for Miss Lawrence.' "'Well, you have. And I've wished a good many times that you wouldn't. I'm sure I never knuckled to her, though she is my great-aunt.' "'I never knuckled to her either,' protested Esther. You've done a sight more for her than I would have done, fixin' her dresses and things, and she with more money than anybody else in town. But your mother ain't going to call on everybody, is she? he asked anxiously. Of course she ain't. Only she said, if it was going to be in June. But I don't want it to be ever, she added, covering her face. Oh, it's all right, said Joe, penitently. He went over and put his arm around her. Nevertheless, his eyes held a worried look. Joe's father had bound him out to a farmer by the name of Norton until his majority, when the sum of seven hundred dollars, all the little fortune the father had left, together with three hundred more from Norton, 
was to be turned over to him. But Joe would not be twenty-one until October. It was going to be difficult for him to arrange for the June wedding Esther desired. He was very much in love, however, and presently he lifted his boyish cheek from her hair. "'I think I'll take that cottage of Lanham's. It's the only vacant house in the village, and he's promised to wait for the rent, so that confounded old Norton needn't advance me a cent.' Esther flushed. "'What do you suppose makes him act so?' she questioned, though she knew. Joe blushed, too. "'He don't like it, because I'm going to work in the factory when it opens. But Miss Norton and Sarah have done everything for me,' he added, decidedly. Up to the time of his engagement, Joe had been in the habit of showing Sarah Norton an occasional brotherly attention, and he would have continued to do so, had not Esther and Mrs. Robinson interfered. Esther, from girlish jealousy, and her mother because she did not approve of the family, she said. She could not say she did not approve of Sarah, for there was not a more upright, self-respecting girl in the village. But Sarah, because of her father's miserliness, often went out for extra work when the neighbors needed help, and this was the real cause of Mrs. Robinson's feeling. Unconsciously, she made the same distinction between Sarah Norton and Esther that some of the more ambitious of the village mothers made between their girls and her own daughter. Then it was common talk that old Jim Norton, for obvious reasons, was displeased with Joe's matrimonial plans, but Mrs. Robinson professed to believe that the wife and daughter were really the ones disappointed. Now Esther began twisting a button of Joe's coat. "'I don't believe Mother'll ask either of them to the wedding,' said she. When Mrs. Robinson entered, Esther stood expectant and fearful by the table. Her mother drew up a chair and reached for the bread. "'I didn't stop anywhere for supper. You've had yours, ain't you?' The girl nodded. "'Joe come?' "'He just left.' But Mrs. Robinson was not to be hurried into divulging the result of her calls. She remained massively mysterious. Esther began to wish she had not hurried Joe off so unceremoniously. After her first cup of tea, however, her mother asked for a slip of paper and a pencil. "'I want that pencil in my machine drawer that writes black, and any kind of paper'll do,' she said. Esther brought them, then she took up her sewing. She was not without a certain self-restraint. Mrs. Robinson, between her sips of tea, wrote— the soft gurgle of her drinking annoyed Esther, and she had a tingling desire to snatch the paper. After a last misdirected placing of her cup in her plate, however, her mother looked up and smiled triumphantly. "'I guess we'll have to plan something different than boxes of cake. Listen to this. Miss Lawrence. No, I won't read that yet. Miss Manning. I went in there because I thought about her not inviting you when she gave that library party. One salt and pepper with rosebuds painted on them. Esther leaned forward. Her face was crimson. "'You needn't look so,' remonstrated her mother. "'It was all I could do to keep from laughing at the way she acted. I just mentioned that we were only going to invite those you were indebted to, and she went and fetched out that salt and pepper. I believe she said they was intended in the first place for some relative that didn't get married in the end.' The girl made an inarticulate noise in her throat. Her mother continued in a loud, impressive tone. "'Miss Stetson, something worked. She hasn't quite decided what.' but she's going to let me know about it. Jane Watson. You didn't go there, mother. Mrs. Robinson treated her daughter to a contemptuous look. I guess I've got sense. Jane was at Miss Stetson's, and when I came away she went along with me, and insisted that I stop and see some lamplighters she got to copy from, those paper balls. She seemed afraid a string of those wouldn't be enough, but I told her how pretty they was and how much you'd be pleased. I guess I'll think a good deal more of em than I will of Miss Manning's salt and pepper. Esther was very near tears. Next I went to the Rogerses, and they've about concluded to give you a lamp, and they can afford to. Then that's all the places I've been, except to Miss Lawrence's, and she—Mrs. Robinson paused for emphasis—she's going to give you a silver tea-set. Esther looked at her mother, her red lips apart. That was the first place I called, and I said pretty plain what I was getting at, but after I knew about the water-set, that settled what kind of wedding we'd have. But the next morning the world looked different. Her rheumatic foot ached, and that always affected her temper. But when they sat down to sew, the real cause of her irascibleness came out. "'Miss Lawrence wasn't any more civil than she need be,' she remarked. "'I guess she decided she'd got to do something, being related to Joe. 
She said she supposed you were expecting a good many presents, and I said no, you didn't look for many, and there were some that you'd done a good deal for, that you knew better than to expect anything from. I was mad. Then she turned kind of red and mentioned about the water set. And in the afternoon a young girl acquaintance added to Esther's perturbation. I just met Susan Rogers, she confided to the other, and she said they hated to give that lamp, but they supposed they were in for it. Esther was not herself for some days. All her pretty dreams were blotted out, and a morbid embarrassment took hold of her. But she was roused to something like her old interest when the presents began to come in, and she saw her mother's active preparations for the wedding. The more so, as over the village seemed to have spread a pleasant excitement concerning the event. Presents arrived from unexpected sources, so that invitations had to be sent afterwards to the givers. Women who had never crossed the Robinson threshold came now like Hindu gift-bearers before some deity whom they wished to propitiate. Meeting there, they exchanged droll, half-deprecating glances. Mrs. Robinson's calls had formed the subject of much laughing comment, but weddings were not common in Marshfield, and the desire to be bidden to this one was universal. It spread like an epidemic. Mrs. Robinson was at first elated. She overlooked the matter of duplicates and accepted graciously every article that was tendered, from a patchwork quilt to a hem-stitched handkerchief. "'You can't have too many of some things,' she remarked to Esther. But later she reversed this statement. Match safes, photograph frames, and pretty nothings accumulated to an alarming extent. "'Now that's the last pincushion you're going to take,' she declared, as she returned from answering a call at the door one evening. "'There's fourteen in the parlor now. Some folks seem to have gone crazy on pincushions.' She grew confused, and the next day she went into the parlor, which, owing to the nature of the display, resembled a booth at a church fair, and made an accurate list of the articles received. When she emerged, her large, handsome face was quite flushed. "'Little wobbly, fall-down things, most of them. It'll take you a week to dust your house if you have all those things standing round.' "'Well, I ain't going to put none of them away,' declared Esther. "'I like ornaments.' "'Glad you do. You've got enough of them, land knows. Ornaments.' The very word seemed to incense her. "'I guess you'll find there's something needed besides ornaments when you come right down to livin'. For one thing, you're awful short of dishes and bedding, and you can't ever have no company unless—' she added with withering sarcasm. "'You give em little vases to drink out of, and put em to bed under a picture drape with a pincushion or a scent bag for a pillar.' And from that time Mrs. Robinson accepted no gift without first consulting her list. It became known that she looked upon useful articles with favor, and brooms and flat-irons and bright tinware arrived constantly. Then it was that the heterogeneous collection began to pall upon Esther. The water-set had not yet been presented, but its magnificence grew upon her, and she persuaded Joe to get a spindle-legged stand on which to place it, although he could not furnish the cottage until October, and had gone in debt for the few necessary things. She pictured the combination first in one corner of the little parlour, then another, finally in a window where it could be seen from the road. Esther's standards did not vary greatly from her mother's. She had a bewildered sense that they were somehow stepping from the beaten track of custom. On one or two points, however, she was firm. The few novels that had come within her reach she had conned faithfully. Thus, even before she had a lover, she had decided that the most impressive hour for a wedding was sunrise, and had arranged the procession which was to wend its way toward the church. And in these matters her mother, respecting her superior judgment, stood staunchly by her. Nevertheless, when the eventful morning arrived, she was bitterly disappointed. She had set her heart on having the church bell rung, and overlooked the fact that the meeting-house bell was cracked, till Joe reminded her. Then the weather was unexpectedly chilly. A damp fog, not yet dispersed by the sun, hung over the barely awakened village, and the little flower-girl shivered. She had a shawl pinned about her, and when the procession was fairly started she tripped over it, and there was a halt, while she gathered up the roses and geraniums in her little trembling hands, and thrust them back into the basket. Celia Smith tittered. Celia was the bridesmaid, and was accompanied by Joe's friend, red-headed Harry Baker, and Mrs. Robinson and Uncle Jonas, who were far behind, made the most of the delay. Mrs. Robinson often explained that she was not a good walker and her brother-in-law tried jocularly to help her along, although he used a cane himself. 
His weather-beaten old face was beaming, but it was as though the smiles were set between the wrinkles, for he kept his mouth sober. He had a flower in his buttonhole which gave him a festive air, despite the fact that his clothes were distinctly untidy. Several buttons were off. He had no wife to keep them sewed on. Esther had given but one glance at him. Her head under its lace veil bent lower and lower. The flounces of her skirt stood out above her like the delicate bell of a hollyhock. She followed the way falteringly. Joe, his young eyes radiant, inclined his curly head towards her, but she did not heed him. The little procession was an awkward garment which hampered and abashed her. But just as they reached the church the sun crept above the treetops, and from the bleakness of dawn the whole scene warmed into the glorious beauty of a June day. The guests lost their aspect of chilled waiting. Esther caught their admiring glances. For one brief moment her triumph was complete. The next she had overstepped its bounds. She went forward, scarcely touching Joe's arm. Her great desire became a definite purpose. She whispered to a member of her Sunday school class, a little fellow. He looked at her wonderingly at first, then darted forward and grasped the rope which dangled down in a corner of the vestibule. He pulled with a will, but even as the old bell responded with a hoarse clank, his arms jerked upward, and with curls flying and fat legs extended, he ascended straight to the ceiling. "'Oh, Suze, the Lord's taking him right up!' shrieked an old woman. The sepulchral explanation of the broken bell, but serving to intensify her terror. And there were others who refused to understand, even when his sister caught him by the heels. She was very white, and she shook him before she set him down. Too scared to realize where he was, he fought her, his little face quite red, and his blouse strained up so that it revealed the girth of his round little body in its knitted undershirt. "'Let me go,' he whimpered. "'She telled me to do it.' His words broke through the general amazement, like a stone through the icy surface of a stream. The guests gave way to mirth. Some of the young girls averted their faces. They could not look at Esther. The matrons tilted their bonneted heads towards one another and shook softly. "'I thought at first it might be a part of the show,' whispered one. "'But I guess it wasn't planned.' Esther was conscious of every whisper and every glance. Shame seemed to engulf her, but she entered the church holding her head high. When they emerged into the sunshine again she would have been glad to run away, but she was forced to pause while her mother made an announcement. "'The refreshments will be ready by ten, she said, and as we calculate to keep the tables running all day, those that can't come one time can come another. After which there was a little rice-throwing, and the young couple departed. The frolic partly revived Esther's spirits, but her mother, toiling heavily along with a hard day's work before her, was inclined to speak her mind. Her brother-in-law, however, restrained her. "'Seems to me I never seen anything quite so cute as that little feller a ringin' that bell for the wedding. Who put him up to it, anyhow?' "'Why, Esther. She was so set on having a chime, as she called it. "'Well, it was a real good idea. A real good idea.' and he kept repeating the phrase, as though in a perfect ecstasy of appreciation. When Esther reached home, she and Joe arranged the tables in the side yard, but when the first guest turned in at the gate, her mother sent her to the house. "'Now you go into the parlour and rest. You can just as well sit under that dove as stand under it,' she said. The girl started listlessly to obey, but the next words revived her like wine. "'I declare, it's Miss Lawrence, and she's bringing that water set.' She hung on to it till the last minute. Esther flew to her chamber and donned her veil, which she had laid aside, then sped downstairs, but when she passed through the parlour she put her hands over her eyes. She wanted to look at the water set first with Joe. He was no longer helping her mother, and she fluttered about looking for him. The rooms would soon be crowded, and then there would be no opportunity to examine the wonderful gift. She darted down a footpath that crossed the yard diagonally. It led to a gap in the stone wall which opened on a lane. Esther and Joe had been in the habit of walking here of an evening. It was scarcely more than a grassy way, overhung by leaning branches of old fruit trees, but it was a short cut to the cottage Joe had rented. Now Esther's feet of their own volition carried her here. She slid through the opening. "'Joe!' she called, and her voice had the tremulous cadence of a bird summoning its mate. But it died away in a little smothered cry for not a rod away was Joe, and sitting on a large stone was Sarah Norton. They had their backs towards her, and were engaged in such an earnest conversation that they did not hear her. 
Sarah's shoulders moved with her quick breathing. She had a hand on Joe's arm. Esther stood staring, her thin drapery circling about her, and her childish face pale. Then she turned, with a swift impulse to escape, but again she paused, her eyes riveted in the opposite direction. From where she stood, the back door of her future home was visible, and two men were carrying out furniture. Involuntarily, she opened her lips to call Joe, but no sound came. Yes, they had the bureau. They would probably take the spindle-legged stand next. A strong, protective instinct is part of possession, and to Esther that sight was as a magnet to steel. Down the grassy lane she sped, but so lightly, that the couple by the wall were as unobservant of her as they were of the wind stirring the long grass. Sarah Norton rose. "'I run every step of the way to get here in time. Please, Joe,' she panted. He shook his head. "'It's real kind of you and your mother, Sarah, but I guess I ain't going to touch any of the money you worked for and earned, and I can't help but think, when I talk to Lanham. I tell you, you can't reason with him in his state. Well, I'll raise it somehow.' "'You'll have to be quick about it, then,' she returned concisely. "'He'll be here in a few minutes, and it's cashed down for the first three months, or he'll let the other party have it.' "'But he promised.' That don't make any difference. He's drunk, and he thought Father had offered to make you an advance. But Father just told him to come down here, that you were being married, and said he'd poke all your things out in the road without you paid. The young man turned. Sarah blocked his way. She was a tall, good-looking girl, somewhat older than Joe, and she looked straight up into his face. See here, Joe. You know what makes Father act so, and so do I, and so does Mother, and Mother and I want you should take this money. It'll make us feel better. Sarah flushed, but she looked at him as directly as if she had been his sister. Joe felt an admiration for her that was almost reverence. It carried him, for the moment, beyond the consideration of his own predicament. "'No, I don't know what makes him act so either,' he cried hotly. "'Oh, Lord, Sarah, you shan't say such a thing!' She interrupted him. "'Won't you take it?' He turned again. "'You're just as good as you can be, but I can manage some way.' "'I'll watch for Lanham,' she answered quietly, "'and keep him talking as long as I can. "'He's just drunk enough to make a scene.' Halfway to the house, Joe met Harry Barker. "'What did she want?' he inquired curiously. When Joe told him, he plunged into his pocket and drew out two dollars, then offered to go among the young fellows and collect the balance of the amount. But Joe caught hold of him. "'Think of something else.' "'I could explain to the boys—' "'You go and ask Mrs. Lawrence if she won't step out on the porch,' the other commanded. "'She's my great-aunt, and I never asked anything of her before.' But Mrs. Lawrence was not sympathetic. She told Joe flatly that she never lent money, and that the water-set was as much as she could afford to give. "'It ain't paid for, though,' she said, "'and if you'd rather have the money, I suppose I can send it back. But it seems to me that I shouldn't have been in such an awful hurry to get married. I should have waited a month or so till I had something to get married on.' "'But you're just like your father, never had no calculation. "'Do you want I should return that silver?' "'Joe hesitated. "'It was an easy way out of the difficulty. "'Then a vision of Esther rose before him, "'and the innocent preparations she had been making "'for the display of the gift. "'No,' he answered shortly. "'And Mrs. Lawrence, with a shake of the shoulders, "'as though she threw off all responsibility "'in her young relative's affairs, bustled away.' "'I'm going to keep that water set if everything else has to go,' he declared to the astonished Harry. "'Let him set me out in the road. I guess I'll get along.' He had a humorous vision of himself and Esther trudging forth with the water set between them to seek their fortune. He flung himself from the porch and was confronted by Jonas Ingram. The old fellow emerged from behind a lilac bush with a guilty yet excited air. "'Young man, I ain't given to eavesdropping, but I was strolling along here and I heard it all, and as I was calculating to give my niece a present. He broke off and laid a hand on Joe's arm. Where is that dod-blasted fool of a Lanham? I'll pay him, then I'll break every bone in his dumb body, he exclaimed, waxing profane. Come here, disturbing decent folks' weddings. Where is he? He started off down the path, striking out savagely with his stick. Joe watched him a moment, then put after him, and Harry Barker followed. If this ain't the liveliest wedding— Nevertheless, he was disappointed in his expectations of an encounter. When the trio emerged through the gap in the wall, they found only Sarah Norton awaiting them. "'Lanham's come and gone,' she announced. 
"'No, I didn't give him a thing except a piece of my mind,' she answered, in a response to a look from Joe. "'I told him that he was acting like a fool, that father was in for a thousand dollars to you in the fall, and that you would pay then, as you promised, and that he'd better clear out.' "'Oh, if I could just get a hold of him,' muttered Jonas Ingram. "'That seemed to sober him,' continued the girl, "'but he said he wasn't the only one that had got scared, "'that Merrill was going for his tables and chairs. "'But Lanham said he'd run up to the cottage, "'and if he was there he'd send him off. "'You see, father threw out as if he wasn't owing you anything,' "'she added in a lower voice, "'and that's what stirred him up.' "'Joe turned white in a sudden heat of anger, "'the first he had shown. "'I'll stir him,' he began. Then his eyes met hers. He reddened. "'Oh, Sarah, I'm ever so much obliged to you.' "'It was nothing. I guess it was lucky I wasn't invited to the wedding, though.' She laughed and started away, leaving Joe abashed. She glanced back. "'I hope none of this foolishness will reach Miss Ellsworth's ears,' she called in a friendly voice. "'I hope it won't,' muttered Joe fervently, and stood watching her till the old man pulled his sleeve. Lanham may not keep his word to the girl. Best go down there, hadn't we? The young man made no answer, but turned and ran. He longed for some one to wreak vengeance on. The other two had difficulty in keeping up with him. The first object that attracted their attention was the bureau. It was standing beside the back steps. Joe tried the door. It was fastened. He drew forth the key and fitted it into the lock, but still the door did not yield. He turned and faced the others. Someone's in there. Jonas Ingram broke forth into an oath. He shook his cane at the house. "'Someone's in there, and they've got the door bolted on the inside,' continued Joe. His voice had a strange sound even to himself. He seemed to be looking on at his own wrath. He strode around to a window, but the blinds were closed. The blinds were closed all over the house. Every door was barred. Whoever was inside was in utter darkness. Joe came back and gave the door a violent shake. Then they all listened but only the pecking of a hen along the wall broke the silence. "'I'll get a crowbar,' suggested Harry, scowling in the fierce sunlight. Jonas Ingram stood with his hair blowing out from under his hat, and his stick grasped firmly in his gnarled old hand. He was all ready to strike. His chin was thrust out rigidly. They both pressed close to Joe, but he did not heed them. He put one shoulder against a panel. Every muscle was set. "'Whoever you are, if I have to break this door down—' There was a soft commotion on the inside, and the bolt was drawn. Joe, with the other two at his heels, fairly burst into the darkened place, just in time to see a white figure dart across the room and cast itself in a corner. For an instant they could only blink. The figure wrapped its white arms about some object. "'You can have everything but this table. You can't have this!' The words ended in a frightened sob. "'Esther!' "'Oh, Joe!' She struggled to her feet then shrank back against the wall. "'Oh, I didn't know it was you. Go away, go away.' "'Why, Esther, what do you mean?' He started towards her, but she turned on him. "'Where is she?' "'Where's who?' She did not reply, but standing against the wall she stared at him with a passionate scorn. "'You don't mean Sarah Norton?' asked Joe slowly. Esther quivered. "'Why, she came to tell me of the trouble her father was trying to get me into.' "'But how did you come here, Esther? How did you know anything about it?' She did not answer. Her head sank. "'How did you, Esther?' "'I saw—I saw you in the lane,' she faltered, then caught up her veil as though it had been a pinafore. Joe went up to her, and Jonas Ingram took hold of Harry Baker, and the two stepped outside, but not out of earshot. They were still curious. They could hear Esther's sobbing voice at intervals. I tried to make them stop, but they wouldn't, and I slipped in past them and bolted the door, and when you came, I thought it was them, and—oh, ain't they our things, Joe?" The old man thrust his head in at the door. Yes, he roared, then withdrew. And won't they take the table away? No, he roared again. I'd just like to see em. Esther wept harder. Oh, I wish they would. I ought to give them up. I didn't care for them after I thought—that— It was just that I had to have something I wouldn't let go, and I tried to think only of saving the table for the water-set. "'Come mighty near being no water-set,' muttered Jonas to himself. Then he turned to his companion. "'Young man, I guess they don't need us no more,' he said. When he regained his sister-in-law's, 
he encountered that lady carrying a steaming dish. Guests stood about under the trees or sat at the long tables. "'For mercy's sakes, Jonas, have you seen Esther? She made fuss enough about having that dove fixed up in the parlor, and she and Joe ain't stood under it a minute yet.' "'That's a fact,' chuckled the old fellow. "'They ain't stood under no dove of peace yet. They're just about ready to now, I reckon.' and up through the lane, all oblivious, the lovers were walking slowly. Just before they reached the gap in the wall, they paused by common consent. Cherry and apple trees drooped over the wall. These had ceased blossoming, but a tangle of wild rose bushes was all a blush. It dropped a thick harvest of petals on the ground. Joe bent his head, and Esther, resting against his shoulder, lifted her eyes to his face. All unconsciously, she took the pose of the woman in the Froman poster. They kissed, and then went on slowly. End of The Marrying of Esther by Mary M. Mears Chapter 10 of Different Girls This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kate Fallis. Different Girls, Harper's Novelettes. Cordelia's Night of Romance by Julian Ralph. Cordelia Angeline Mahoney was dressing, as she would say, to keep a date with a beau who would soon be waiting on the corner nearest her home in the big barracks tenement house. She smiled as she heard the shrill cat call of a lad in Forsyth Street. She knew it was Dutch Johnny's signal to Chrissy Bergen to come down and meet him at the street doorway. Presently she heard another call, a bird-like whistle and she knew which boy's note it was and which girl it called out of her home for a sidewalk stroll she smiled a trifle sadly and yet triumphantly she had enjoyed herself when she was no wiser and looked no higher than the younger barracks girls who took up the boys of the neighbourhood as if there were no others she was in her own little dark inner room which she shared with only two others of the family arranging a careful toilet by kerosene light the photograph of herself in trunks and tights of which we heard in the story of elsa muller's hopeless love was before her among several portraits of actresses and salaried beauties she had taken them out from under the paper in the top drawer of the bureau she always kept them there and always took them out and spread them in the lamplight when she was alone in her room she glanced approvingly at the portrait of herself as a picture of which she had said to more than one girlish confidant that it showed as neat a figure and as perfectly shaped limbs as any actresses she had ever seen but the suggestion of a frown flitted across her brow as she thought how silly she was to have once been stage-struck how foolish to have thought that mere beauty could quickly raise a poor girl to a high place on the stage julia fogarty's case proved that julia and she were stage-struck together and where was julia or corinne belvedere as she now called herself she started well as a figurante in a comic opera company uptown but from that she dropped to a female minstrel troupe in the bowery and now louis tache told cordelia she was to in der skirt dance in der picnic parks for der sick baby fund and passen der hat around afterwards and evil was being whispered of her a pretty high price to pay for such small success and it must be true because she sometimes came home late at night in cabs which are devilish, except when used at funerals. It was Cordelia who attracted Elsa Muller's sweetheart, Yank Hurst, to her side, and left Elsa to die yearning for his return, and it was Cordelia who threw Hurst aside when he took to drink and stabbed the young man who, during a mere walk from church, took his place beside Cordelia. 
and yet cordelia was only ambitious not wicked few men live who would not look twice at her she was not of the stunted tenement type like her friends rosie mulvey and minnie beckham and julia moriarty she was tall and large and stately and yet plump in every outline moreover she had the style of an american girl and looked as well in five dollars worth of clothes all home-made except her shoes and stockings as almost any girl in richer circles it was too bad that she was called a flirt by the young men and a stuck-up thing by the girls when in fact she was merely more shrewd and calculating than the others who were content to drift out of the primary schools into the shops and out of the shops into haphazard matrimony cordelia was not lovable but not all of us are who may be better than she she was monopolized by the hope of getting a man but a mere alliance with trousers was not the sum of her hope they must jingle with coin it was strange then that she should be dressing to meet jerry donahue who was no better than gilly to the commissioner of public works drawing a small salary from a clerkship he never filled while he served the commissioner as a second left hand but if we could see into cordelia's mind we would be surprised to discover that she did not regard herself as flesh and blood mahoney but as romantic clarice de l'amour and she only thought of jerry as james the butler the voracious reader of the novels of to-day will recall the story of clarice or only a lady's maid which many consider the best of the several absorbing tales that lula jane tilly has written cordelia had read it twenty times and almost knew it by heart her constant dream was that she could be another clarice and shape her life like hers the plot of the novel needs to be briefly told since it guided cordelia's course clarice was made to a wealthy society dowager james the butler fell in love with clarice when she first entered the household and she hearing the servants gossip about james's savings and salary had encouraged his attentions he pressed her to marry him but young nicholas duvisant came home from abroad to find his mother ill and clarice nursing her every day he noticed the modest rosy maid moving noiselessly about like a sunbeam her physical perfection profoundly impressed him in her presence he constantly talked to his mother about his admiration for healthy women each evening clarice reported to him the condition of the mother and on one occasion mentioned that she had never known ache pain or malady in her life the young man often chatted with her in the drawing-room and james the butler got his conge mr stuyvesant induced his mother to make clarice her companion and then he met her at picture exhibitions and in central park by chance and next every one will recall the exciting scene he paid passionate court to her in the pink sewing-room where she had reclined on soft silken sofa pillows with her tiny slippers upon the head of a lion whose skin formed a rug before her clarice thought him unprincipled and repulsed him when the widow recovered her health and went to newport the former maid met all society there a gifted lawyer fell a victim to clarice's charms and on a moonlit porch overlooking the sea warned her against young stuyvesant on learning that the roue had already attempted to weaken the girl's high principles to rescue her he made her his wife he was soon afterward elected mayor of new york but remained a suitor for his beautiful wife's approbation waiting upon her in gilded halls with the fidelity of a knight of old cordelia adored clarice and fancied herself just like her beautiful ambitious poor with the future of her own carving of course such a case is phenomenal no other young woman was ever so ridiculous you have on your best dress cordelia 
said her mother it'll soon be wore out and you'll get no other with your father oidle and no one earning a penny but you and johnny and sarah rosebell where are you going i won't be gone long said cordelia half out of the hall door cordelia angeline darlin said her mother my now don't let them be talking about ye wherever ye go shaking your skirts and ruling your eyes it don't look well for a girl to be making herself attractive oh mother i'm not attractive and you know it with her head full of meeting jerry donahue cordelia tripped down the four flights of stairs to the street door as clarice she thought of jerry as james the butler in fact all the bows she had had of late were so many repetitions of the unfortunate james in her mind all the other characters in her acquaintance were made to fit more or less loosely into her romance life and she thought of everything she did as if it all happened in lula jane tilly's beautiful novel let the reader fancy if possible what a feat that must have been for a tenement girl who had never known what it was to have a parlour in our sense of the word who had never known courtship to be carried on indoors except in a tenement hallway and who had to imagine that the sidewalk flirtations of actual life were meetings in private parks that the wharves and public squares and tenement roofs where she had seen all the young men and women making love were heavily carpeted drawing-rooms broad manor house verandas and the fragrant conservatories of luxurious mansions but cordelia managed all this mental necromancy easily to her own satisfaction and now she was tripping down the bare wooden stairs beside the dark greasy wall and thinking of her future husband the rich mayor who must be either the bachelor police captain of the precinct or george fletcher the wealthy and unmarried factory owner near by or perhaps senator eisenstone the district leader who she was forced to reflect was an unlikely hero for a catholic girl since he was a hebrew but just as she reached the street door and decided that jerry would do well enough as a mere temporary james the butler and while jerry was waiting for her on the corner she stepped from the stoop directly in front of george fletcher good evening said the wealthy young employer good evening mr fletcher it's very embarrassing said mr fletcher i know your given name cordelia isn't it but your last name oh thank you miss mahoney of course you know we met at that very queer wedding in the home of my little apprentice joe the lineman's wedding you know <laughs> cordelia giggled wasn't that a terrible strange wedding i think it was just terrible were you going somewhere oh not at all mr fletcher with another nervous giggle or two i have no plans on me mind only to get out of doors it's terrible hot ain't it may i take a walk with you miss mahoney it seemed to her that if he had called her clarice the whole novel would have come true then and there i can't be out very late mr fletcher said she with a giggle of delight are you sure i'm not disarranging your plans had you no engagements oh no said she i was only going out with me lonely let us take just a short walk then said fletcher only you must be the man and take me in charge miss mahoney for i never walked with a young lady in my life oh certainly not you never did i don't think upon my honour miss mahoney i know only one woman in this city miss whitfield the doctor's daughter who lives in the same house with you and only one other in the world my aunt who brought me up in vermont well indeed did cordelia know this all the neighbourhood knew it and most of the other girls were conscious of a little flutter in their breasts when his eyes fell upon them in the streets for it was the gossip of all who knew his workmen that the prosperous ladder-builder lived in his factory 
where his had spent the life of a monk without any society except of his canaries his books and his workmen well i declare sighed cordelia how terrible cunning you men are to get up such a story to make all the girls think you're romantic but oh how happy cordelia was at last she had met her prince the future mayor her sultan of the gilded halls in that humid sticky midsummer heat among the tenements every other woman dragged along as if she weighed a thousand pounds but cordelia felt like a feather floating among clouds the babble did the reader ever walk up forsyth street on a hot night into second avenue and across to avenue a and up to tompkins park the noise of the tens of thousands on the pavements makes a babble that drowns the racket of the carts and cars the talking of so many persons the squalling of so many babies the mothers scolding and slapping every third child the yelling of the children at play the shouts and loud repartee of the men and women all these noises rolled together in the air makes a steady hum and roar that not even the breakers on a hard sea beach can equal you might say that the tenements were empty as only the very sick who could not move were in them for miles and miles they were bare of humanity each flat unguarded and unlocked with the women on the sidewalks with the youngest children in arms or in perambulators while those of the next sizes romped in the streets with the girls and boys of fourteen giggling in groups in the doorways the age and places where sex first asserts itself and only the young men and women missing for they were in the parks on the wharves and on the roofs all frolicking and love-making and every house-front was like a russian stove expending the heat it had sucked from the all-day sun and every door and window breathed bad air air without oxygen rich and rank and stifling but cordelia was clarice the future mayoress she did not know she was picking a tiresome way around the boys at leapfrog and the mothers and babies and baby carriages she did not notice the smells or feel the bumps she got from those who ran against her she thought she was in the blue drawing-room at newport where a famous hungarian count was trilling the soft prelude to a shardus on the piano and mr souvidance had just introduced her to the future mayor who was spellbound by her charms and was by her side a captive she reached out her hand and it touched mr fletcher's arm just as a ragamuffin propelled himself head first against her and mr fletcher bent his elbow and her wrist rested in the crook of his arm oh her dream was true her dream was true mr fletcher on the other hand was hardly in a more natural relation he was trying to think how the men talked to women in all the literature he had read the myriad jokes about the fondness of girls for ice-cream recurred to him and he risked everything on their fidelity to fact are you fond of ice-cream he inquired oh no i don't think said cordelia what are you asking next what girl ain't crushed on ice-cream i'd like to know do you know of a nice place to get some do i the dutchman's on the avenue another block up is the finest in the city you get more that is you get everything way up in g there with cakes on the side and it don't cost no more than anywhere else so to the germans they went and clarice fancied herself at the casino in newport all the girls around her who seemed to be trying to swallow the spoons took on the guise of blue-blooded bells while the noisy boys and young men calling out holy jay fellas look at nifty gittin out der winder without payin and say tilly what kind of cream is dat you're feedin your face wit seemed to her so many millionaires and the exquisite sons thereof to mr fletcher the german's backyard saloon with its green lattice walls and its rusty dead christmas trees and painted butter kegs 
appeared uncommonly brilliant and fine the fact that whenever he took a swallow of water the ice cream turned to cold candle grease in his mouth made no difference he was happy and cordelia was in an ecstasy by the time he had paid a shock-headed bare-armed german waiter and they were again on the avenue side by side she put out her hand and rested it on his arm again to make sure she was clarice one would like to know whether in the breasts of such as these familiar environment exerts any remarkable influence if so it could have been in but one direction for that part of town was one vast nursery everywhere on every side were the swarming babies a baby for every flagstone in the pavements babies and babies and little besides babies except larger children and the mothers perambulators with two even three baby passengers mothers with as many as five children trailing after them babies in broad baggy laps babies at the breast babies creeping toppling screaming overflowing into the gutters such was the unbroken scene from the big barracks to tompkins square a to harlem and to the east river and almost to broadway in the park as if the street scenes had been merely preliminary the paths were alive wriggling with babies of every age from the newborn to the children in pigtails and knickerbockers and lo these were already paired and practising at courtship the walk that cordelia was taking was amid a fever a delirium of maternity a rhapsody a baby's opera if one considered its noise in that vast region no one inquired whether marriage was a failure nothing that is old and long beloved and human is a failure there in tompkins park while they dodged babies and stepped around babies and over them they saw many happy couples on the settees and they noticed that often the men held their arms around the waists of their sweethearts girls too in other instances leaned loving heads against the young men's breasts blissfully regardless of publicity they passed a young man and a woman kissing passionately as kissing is described by unmarried girl novelists cordelia thought it no harm to nudge mr fletcher and whisper sakes alive they're right in it ain't they it's funny when you feel that way ain't it as many another man who does not know the frankness and simplicity of the plain people might have done mr fletcher misjudged the girl he thought her the sort of girl he was far from seeking he grew instantly cold and reserved and she knew vaguely that she had displeased him i think people who make love in public should be locked up said he some folks want everybody put away that enjoys themselves said cordelia then lest she had spoken too strongly she added present company not intended mr fletcher but you said that like them mission folks that come around praising themselves and telling us all we're wicked and do you think a girl can be good who behaves so in public i know plenty that's done it said she and i don't know any girls but what's good they ain't got wings maybe but you don't want to monkey with em neither he recollected her words for many a year afterward and pondered them and perhaps they enlarged his understanding she also often thought of his condemnation of love-making out of doors kissing in public especially promiscuous kissing she knew to be a debatable pastime but she also knew that there was not a flat in the big barracks in which a girl could carry on a courtship fancy her attempting it in her front room with the room choked with people with the baby squalling and her little brothers and sisters quarrelling with her mother entertaining half a dozen women visitors with tea or beer and with a man or two dropping in to smoke with her father parlor courtship was to her like precise english a thing only known in novels the thought of novels floated her soul back into the dream state i think cordelia's a pretty name said fletcher cold at heart but struggling to be companionable i don't 
said cordelia i'm not at all crushed on it your name's terrible pretty i think my three names looks like a map of ireland when they're written down i know a killin name for a girl it's clarice maybe some day i'll give you a dare i'll double dare you maybe to call me clarice oh if he only would she thought if he would only call her so now but she forgot how unelastic his strange routine of life must have left him and she did not dream how her behaviour in the park had displeased him cordelia is a pretty name he repeated at any rate i think we should try to make the most and best of whatever name has come to us i wouldn't sail under false colours for a minute oh said she with a giggle to hide her disappointment you're so terrible wise when you talk them big words you can pass me in a walk anxious to display her great conquests to the other girls of the barracks neighbourhood cordelia persuaded mr fletcher to go to what she called the dock to enjoy the cool breath of the river all the piers and wharves are called docks by the people those which are semi-public and are rented to miscellaneous excursion and river steamers are crowded nightly the wharf to which our couple strolled was a mere flooring above the water edged with a stout string piece which formed a bench for the mothers they were there in groups some seated on the string piece with babes in arms or with perambulators before them and others facing these standing and joining in the gossip and swaying to and fro to soothe their little ones those who gave their offspring the breast did so publicly unembarrassed by a modesty they would have considered false a few youthful couples boy by girl and girl by boy sat on the string piece and whispered or bandied fun with those other lovers who patrolled the flooring of the wharf a gang of rude young men toughs walked up and down teasing the girls wrestling scuffling and roaring out bad language troops of children played at leapfrog high spy jackstones beanbag hopscotch and tag at the far end of the pier some young men and women waltzed while a lad on the string piece played for them on his mouth organ a steady cool vivifying breeze from the bay swept across the wharf and fanned all the idlers and blew out of their heads almost all recollection of the furnace-like heat of the town cordelia forgot her desire to display her conquest she forgot her true self she likened the wharf to that lordly veranda overlooking the sea where the future mayor begged clarice to be his bride she knew just what she would say when her prince spoke his lines she and mr fletcher were just about to seat themselves on the great rim of the wharf when an uproar of the harsh frog-like voices of half-grown men caused them to turn around they saw jerry donahue striding towards them but with difficulty because half a dozen lads and youths were endeavouring to hold him back that's mr fletcher they said it ain't his fault jerry he's dead square he's a gent jerry the politician's gilly tore himself away from his friends the gang of toughs gathered behind the others jerry planted himself in front of cordelia evidently he did not know the submissive part he should have played in cordelia's romance james the butler made no outbreak but here was jerry angry through and through you didn't keep to date with me he began oh jerry i did i tried to but you cordelia was red with shame the hell you did wasn't i here said mr fletcher you can't swear at this lady why wouldn't i jerry asked what would you do he's right jerry leave him be see said the chorus of jerry's friends ah snarled jerry let him leave me be then cordelia i heard you was a dead fraud and now i know it and i'm a-tellin you so straight see i was a-waitin cross der street and i seen you come out and meet dis mug and you never turned your head to see was i on me post i seen dat and i'm a-tellin your friend just de kind of a racket you give me de same's you've given a hundred other fellers den if he likes it he knows what he's gittin 
jerry was so angry that he all but pushed his distorted face against that of the humiliated girl as he denounced her mr fletcher gently moved her backward a step or two and advanced to where she had stood that will do he said to jerry i want no trouble but you've said enough if there's more say it to me ah exclaimed the gilly expectorating theatrically over his shoulder me friends is on your side and i ain't pickin no muss with you but she's got to front of der city hall to do me like she done and say fellers den she was goin to give me a song and dance but lookin for me bah she knows my opinion of her see the crowd parted to let mr fletcher finish his first evening's gallantry to a lady by escorting cordelia to her home it was a chilly and mainly a silent journey cordelia falteringly apologized for jerry's behavior but she inferred from what mr fletcher said that he did not fully join her in blaming the angry youth mr fletcher touched her fingertips in bidding her good night and nothing was said of a meeting in the future clarice was forgotten and cordelia was not only herself again but quite a miserable self for her sobs awoke the little brother and sister who shared her bed End of cordelia's night of romance by julian ralph